Hello everyone, this is Nick Shramick and Howard Chow with Dune Insights. So we're here uh, again for another episode of our podcast, What's Next In? Uh, in this podcast, it's all about perception. So Howard interviews three startups doing different things in the perception space. Uh, they are Compound Eye, Analog Photonics, and Undertow. So uh, Howard, uh, this space, perception, it's it's all about this this uh, journey of, of assisting drivers and eventually taking over the role of drivers. Uh, how have you seen the development of perception over the past uh, decade? Well, as you know, um, the goal of L5 has been uh, delayed, shall we say. I mean, there have been there were great expectations about how quickly we, we can get there, uh, but um, we certainly have not um, gotten there as fast as some people have predicted, and, and there are some that are predicting we won't get there anytime soon, right? But in the meantime, there's lots of opportunity uh, on, on the journey, as you say, um, and, um, and most people think that we should be spending more time on EDAS and other uh, the steps on towards uh, total uh, autonomy. Uh, this set of interviews we put together because um, the, the three the three startups are each of them very very strong and impressive uh, founders and technologies. Uh, they're focused on very different spaces. One is a radar, another one is lidar, another one is a software company that um, processes uh, information from cameras. Each of them makes very impressive claims, um, next generation claims for their respective technologies. Each of them has a different vision of how things will unfold, what the scenario is for progress in, in perception. And I think they're um, inconsistent with each other. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a phenomenon we've seen in quite a few different areas within um, you know, auto tech and, and mobility, which is you know, people just predict uh, that the use of technology and how technology will unfold is, is different one from the other, even though each of them are really smart people and uh, one, one by one, you would be very persuaded by them <laughs> if you listen to these presentations. So that, that's the thing I find very interesting about this set of um, presentations and, and why we put them together. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, uh, perception is a, is a great example of how you know, when, when innovation bottlenecks occur, you get these really interesting moments of right. innovation to occur. So we have all these startups and uh, every year we come by numerous perception startups that are looking at this problem from a different angle, trying to find a way to balance the uh, the, the movement forward to, towards this goal of auto automation and autonomous vehicles versus the cost to, to automakers and to right. consumers. Uh, it's, right. it's just a fascinating space. And, and, and bear in mind that each of these startups has to, has to survive to get to, you know, uh, real revenues and commercialization. So what is their strategy towards that when, when the sales cycle with the big OEMs is, is pretty slow, as we all know? Um, and meanwhile, they, they, they need to earn some revenues, right? So I think that's another theme that it's interesting to, to focus on as you listen to these presentations. Yeah, great. Well, with that, let's turn it over to the interviews with uh, Howard and uh, the, the founders of Analog Photonics, Compound Eye, and Undertow. Hi, this is Howard Chow at Dune Insights, uh, and joining me from Compound Eye is Jason Devitt, uh, the founder and CEO, along with uh, my friend Raymond Dunn, who is at Honda, who will be my co-interviewer for this uh, session. Um, so before we get into the substance, I wanted to ask um, uh, Mr. Dunn to self-introduce a little bit um, and tell us what you do. Thank you, Howard. Hey, Jason. Good to see you again. Uh, I'm Raymond Zeng, Managing Director of Honda Innovations. Uh, we are an open innovation and mentoring arm for Honda, the corporate. Uh, we, you know, running under the umbrella of Honda Accelerator, which I'm heading. Um, think of Honda Accelerator as um, a startup's gateway into Honda, whether it's wanting to build a relationship or proof of concept or some sort of partnership or maybe Honda wanted to invest into the startup. Um, because of that, we always keep our eyes open uh, for any unique startups, including the areas of autonomous driving, assisted driving, robotics. Therein, I met with Jason and team, uh, I believe it was 2021. That's and right. That, I'll leave it to you. Great. Uh, so thank you, Raymond. Uh, so turning to Jason, uh, can we start by asking you to introduce your personal background a little bit and also the origin story of the company? Oh, of course. Well, thanks very much for having me, Art. Um, my name is Jason Devitt. I'm the CEO and co-founder at uh, Compound Eye. Um, I'm an engineer by training. Uh, this is my uh, third venture-backed startup. I built and sold a couple of companies that developed applications for mobile phones. And um, 
And I've always been fascinated by computer vision and by <laughs> biological vision, by the principles by which we and other animals can kind of perceive the world around us. And after selling my last company, um, together with a small team, I became really interested in, could we teach a phone or other machine to see in the same way? And uh, we developed a very lightweight and fast solution to allow a phone to understand its environment in 3D. And at the time we had, there were many potential applications for this. And I think since then, there's been a lot of interest in areas like augmented reality and metaverse is a buzzword for another day and another conversation. But as we started to show our work to other people, uh, we learned that there was a much bigger opportunity and to us much more compelling and interesting and a bigger impact to leave a dent in the universe um, by solving the pro problem of how do robots and cars understand and perceive their environment in 3D. And we met with a major robotics company that told us straight away that what we had was the solution to their problem and that, that's what kickstarted the company. Terrific, interesting. So as you know, uh, our event is gonna be focused on auto and mobility. So we're gonna try to uh, zero in on that application of your technology. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit more about how you envision uh, your technology to be used by that sector. Okay, well, we are today focusing on shall we say ground vehicles. There are two major markets that we're addressing. One is automotive and the other is the market for heavy equipment um, up to and including defense, which we can talk about separately if, uh, if you're interested. But in the world of automotive, um, cars and trucks and every system that needs to move autonomously through the environment need to understand the environment, to perceive the environment in 3D and in real time in, in order to pass safely through it. And the question is how to do that. The industry has for some time been preoccupied with the idea of using sensing technologies like LIDAR um, or next generation imaging uh, or so-called HD radar to do that. Our focus is on cameras. And the reason for that is that cameras are essential sensors. Cameras are deployed on every vehicle already. There's 270 million cameras will ship on cars this year. Uh, the numbers are phenomenal. Our cameras are cheap and they're ubiquitous, but cameras are inherently 2D sensors. And the problem that we've solved is how do you take that stream of video from an automotive grade camera and produce a reliable, robust, accurate 3D model of the world around the car? And we figured out how to do that uh, accurately, efficiently, and in real time, all in software using automotive grade cameras and using automotive grade processors uh, to do all of the work. Uh, our business model is to provide a software license to um, auto manufacturers or to tier one suppliers. We, in the parlance of the industry, we're a tier two provider of software to tier one automotive suppliers. Uh, and to solve this fundamental problem using existing practical hardware that's available today. Uh, if we're successful, then we make uh, then our software is deployed on, on every new vehicle in the world, um, 100 million cars and trucks a year, and uh, other technologies like LiDAR and radar may still have a place, uh, but that place will be substantially reduced compared to uh, the kind of compelling benefits that you can get with cameras. Yeah, I, just, I think just at that point from an from a OEM perspective, I think you're always looking for multiple channels of sensing. I think having a, a stereo camera, a 3D, giving 3D images, 3D information in combination with other sensor modes as like radar, LIDAR would actually provide redundancy, which is really a key part of the safety uh, for OEM. So that's why I think this is very interesting technology. Yeah, yeah. I go ahead. And I, and I take it the different, the big differentiator for you is going from 2D to 3D um, and that most optical systems are limited by 2D. And, and I, I was looking at some of your materials and, and it looked like uh, your, your competitors are mainly, um, uh, I mean, they, that, that's your differentiator, right? I mean, there may be one or I think you noted there may be one other that's doing that, but um, is, that, is that right? 
Yeah, I mean, there's there's a uh, to, this also picks up on the on the point that Raymond was just making, which is that um, the most people in the industry are using cameras for scene understanding and some other sensing modality for depth information. Right. And, and there are very, very few who are, who are utilizing cameras or have figured out how to utilize cameras for depth information as well. Right. That can be as a complete substitute for other sensing modalities, or as Raymond uh, uh, pointed out, as a fully redundant solution to other sensing modalities. But the practice in the industry to date has been, we use one kind of sensor for depth, typically radar actually now, and, right. and we use cameras for, for sensing. And yes, there's only a handful of companies who've, who've figured out how to reliably do sensing, depth sensing of cameras. So uh, go ahead, Raymond. Yeah, Jason, also I wanted to lead into something that you guys are uh, slightly different or, or differentiated from others because um, you know, stereo camera is nothing new. The concept has been for decades. Um, and I actually have looked at a few other startups that are doing a stereo camera. However, there's always a limitation of the impact of positioning and the impact of the relative position. It always, you know, has to calibrate it, you know, uh, very frequently in order to work correctly. I think you guys are doing something that can overcome that obstacle, correct? Yes. So there's uh, there's there's two important points there. One is that uh, there's a host of folks who will show you a two camera system where what they're doing is figuring out where is everything in the scene by triangulation, by triangulating the location of every point in the scene as seen in those two cameras. The, it's a critical thing to understand is that's not the only thing that, that humans do um, or that other living things do. We're also able to move our heads around and, uh, and derive the same information from, a, for, from each eye independently uh, through the motion of our, of our bodies. And we're also able to look at a single frame of video from a single camera and make lots of inferences that are correct about the relative proportions of the scene. Um, and what we're doing is, first of all, we're doing all of those things. So our, our goal is that our system gracefully degrades to working with just one camera and still giving you excellent results, uh, even, even uh, um, it, with the two camera system. And that's a profound difference from our competitors. And the other important difference is that we're not actually selling a stereo camera in the sense of here's a box that has two cameras mounted inside it. We're working with two cameras that could be placed anywhere on the vehicle. Um, often perhaps behind the review mirror or, or in the head and in the headlight or one camera uh, uh, at the top of the windshield and one camera on the dash. Uh, there, are, there are multiple opportunities there. And so uh, we're able to, in many cases, use cameras that the, our customer is, has already deployed or is planning to deploy on their system. And we're simply adding software rather than this bulky extra box that takes up half your windshield. So Jason, I, this is very interesting. I, I would like to start to relate this particular conversation to the actual situation and chronology of the autonomous driving or uh, autonomous vehicle development um, um, scenarios going forward. Yes. Uh, because um, you know, there, the, the thing that's quite interesting about this whole area is that there's the, the, the diversity of opinion about what is going to happen and what is needed and when it will happen, right? Um, so maybe you can say a little bit about the use cases for your technology and the, under, the, the assumptions that underpin your um, business uh, use cases. In other words, mm -hmm. when is it that L3 is gonna happen, L4 is gonna happen, and why it is that, that your solution is particularly um, practical? Great questions. So first of all, one way I'd like to think about this, and um, this is something I borrowed from one of our investors, Vinod Kosla, is that there are many paths up a mountain. And there's a general consensus in the industry that there are two, that everybody is targeting a fully autonomous vehicle that we can, uh, that a consumer can own. Uh, but there are two, at this point, extremely different paths that people are taking to get there. And one is the all or nothing path. We're gonna build a fully autonomous vehicle from day one that's deployed first as a taxi uh, in, because the napkin math suggests that will pay for itself and then we'll extract costs over time and make that cheaper and more efficient. And then 
the automakers for the most part are looking like how can we incrementally move towards a fully autonomous vehicle, starting with L2 systems, getting more advanced and, and slowly reducing the burden on the driver. Um, and those in a PowerPoint deck, those, sound, those both sounded uh, like very, very practical approaches uh, five years ago. I'm increasingly confident that the automakers are on the right track and the only way that we're going to get there or the most likely way that we're going to get there is incrementally uh, by building successfully, successively more powerful and more compelling ADAS systems, um, neglecting the SAE levels until there comes a point where the system is so powerful, so reliable, the manufacturers have so much confidence in its performance that yes, possibly you can climb into the back seat of the vehicle. Um, and one of the reasons that's working one of the reasons I'm confident about that is that it's actually a self-financing business where the automakers are able to sell this product, uh, this partial product, partial automation product for more than it costs them to manufacture and plow the resources back into the development of the system. Meanwhile, the L4 business is, uh, the L4 track is $100 billion in and counting, um, mm -hmm. according to some recently published numbers. And it's, it's, it still could be another five years away for, for someone to deliver a really uh, kind of compelling robo-taxi service. Now, in the light of that, it becomes, how does that attract through to our business? Well, uh, you know, on the, on the one side, on the L4 side, maybe it's we're going to the autonomous vehicle companies and saying, hey, we've got a path now to help you reduce the cost and increase the reliability of your system once you get to scale. When, we're, when we talk to the automakers, it's we've got a path to help you deliver incremental value and deliver a better service next year than you had this year. And I'm finding that track to be a lot more compelling and those, uh, those opportunities to be much larger and, and, and much closer to reality than, uh, than the L4 path. Yeah, so you know, in, in some cases you're out there in the marketplace, you look at technologies and they seem to be having to choose between either the long-term or the short-term. Yes, and you're saying is that you can have your cake and eat it too. It sounds like. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> well, I, I'm saying that just you know, 50 percent of new cars in America this year uh, have L2 features, um, meaning that they will uh, at least on some trim trim level they will offer you a, a highly. They'll take over both steering angle and uh, uh, and acceleration and braking. And, and that's and people are paying for them, and for the most part, consumers really love them. And uh, I, I think that is a proven path to success and progress. And there are all sorts of uh, opportunities to create more and more compelling features. Um, on the other side of the equation, on the L4 side, I'm rooting for the success of those companies. Um, but in order for their model to work, they first of all have to prove that there is quite a large amount of demand for a fully autonomous vehicle fully autonomous taxi service and that they can deliver it today. Yeah. So we're, we're running short on time, but mm -hmm. there are a couple other areas that I'd really like to cover. One is commercial traction. Uh, mm -hmm. How far have you gotten? And then also your capital formation status. So maybe you can cover those for us. Sure. So the highlights there, most of our customer arrangements are confidential, but what I can say is we, our customers include Fortune 500 uh, robotics company, um, a major automaker, uh, and we're doing a lot of work for on the defense side, an area that we didn't get to get into at all and, and, and could be opened up for some time. But suffice it to say that uh, the, um, the, the U.S. Army has taken a lot of interest in our work. Very good. In terms of our capital pro, uh, formation, um, the company has raised a Series A round. We raised a uh, total of uh, $8 million dollars from uh, investors starting with a seed round led by Canine Ventures and a Series A round that was led by Coastal Ventures. Very good. And plans for the future? Now we're just starting to talk to folks about our next round. Uh, we have a lot of exciting opportunities out there. And what we're looking to do in the course of our next round is uh, raise the capital necessary to scale up this product, address all of the major automakers uh, and tier one suppliers, and also extend and build on the work that we've been doing with folks on the heavy equipment and, uh, and defense side. Yeah, very good. Raymond, I'm gonna let you have the last word or question. 
what anything you want to add to this? No, I instead of asking question, I don't know how much time you quickly show your vision of the the images that, that you're showing. We'll probably give people an idea what's capable of doing. Just a quick, maybe 10, 15 seconds. Oh, absolutely. So uh, for context, what we do is we mount two cameras on the, um, uh, we use a minimum of two cameras on a vehicle. Uh, we're connected to a very lightweight uh, computer. And here's some footage that we shot uh, just uh, a few months ago when we were driving around Germany with, uh, with a customer that will remain nameless. And what you're looking for, what you're looking at in the top left is this is what the input from the camera looks like. In the bottom left, you can see the depth map. You can see pedestrians running around in the depth map. Um, and in the top right, there's a semantic segmentation of the scene where we're highlighting different objects and vehicles. And in the bottom right uh, is the full 3D representation, the 3D point cloud that I can maneuver around and, and which I can use to, to take measurements. And this and, and, and a lot of other data is gathered in, is, uh, is all computed in real time on embedded hardware, on embedded automotive grade hardware uh, using our software. Terrific. Very exciting. Hi, this is Howard Chow. And with me today, I have uh, three gentlemen, um, Raymond uh, Liao, who's with a Honda Accelerator, uh, who will be my co-interviewer today, and Mike Watts and Greg Schmolka of Analog Photonics, which is a very cool startup out of MIT. And so I'm going to ask now um, uh, Mike and Greg to give us a um, an introduction to the company. What, what is the origin story of the company and also maybe a little bit about yourselves? Sure. Uh, so I'm Mike Watts. I'm the founder and CEO of Analog Photonics. I started Analog Photonics formally in 2012, uh, but our first financial year was in 2014. I was a professor at MIT at the time uh, in the electrical engineering and computer science department. Um, and uh, we started off, uh, you know, trying to uh, provide access to our silicon photonics uh, to, uh, you know, defense companies, actually, just as a, really as a service um, uh, design, uh, fab, and test. Uh, and then uh, in 2015, I got tenure at MIT, and I took a leave of absence. Uh, to grow analog photonics and uh, really turn it into a product company. Um, and there's really two sides of the company. One is on silicon photonic uh, optical phased array LIDAR, and the other is on uh, silicon photonics uh, for datacom uh, and telecom applications. And they're really both built off of the same 300 millimeter silicon photonics platform that we've been developing for the past uh, decade or more. Uh, and uh, you know, today we're, I believe, the world leaders in optical phased array uh, based LIDAR uh, and uh, you know, uh, really going after the automotive uh, applications there. Uh, and uh, we're also commercializing silicon photonic transceiver chips for the data company. Thanks. So Mike, maybe you can go uh, one layer deeper and explain to us uh, and to the audience, um, what is special about phased array and what's different about your technology that makes it uh, a leading technology? Yeah, so um, I think what's special about our uh, optical phased array LIDAR is that there it is truly solid state. Uh, there are no moving parts. We're able to steer the beam fully electronically and very rapidly with our phased array system. Um, which is in stark contrast to really every other, uh, you know, uh, long range LIDAR in particular system that I can think of. Um, so everyone else pretty much has to use mechanics of some form. So MEMS based steering uh, or large mirrors. And instead, we're using a phase array, which is a series of antennas that are closely spaced um, with phase shifters behind them. And uh, by adjusting the phase of the light emitted out of each of these antennas, we can uh, change the, um, the phase front of what's emitted. And by changing the phase front, uh, you change the direction of propagation of the wave. And you can really think of the phase front as uh, the same as you know, an ocean wave coming in at the beach at the peaks and valleys of that uh, ocean wave. Um, and as you change the, uh, the direction of that phase front, you really are changing the direction of the emitted beam. This is very much analogous to what has happened in radar. So if you look at um, 
radar in the automotive space. It started off as pulsed and mechanically steered and then moved to phased array based and coherent. <clears throat> Um, and if you look at the market leading LIDAR companies today, what are they? They're pulsed, mechanically steered systems that are very difficult to integrate into a vehicle. They're fairly expensive. Um, they're you know, susceptible to sunlight and interference uh, from other LIDARs um, and really not an ideal platform uh, for consumer vehicles in particular. And what are we doing? We're implementing you know, a coherent FMCW uh, phased array um, chip scale solution that's truly uh, flat, uh, so it has a very nice form factor for integration, has no moving parts, and is uh, not susceptible to sunlight or interference. And so, in that way, it's very much analogous to what has happened with automotive data. Can I can I chime in quickly from a, from a industry's perspective, right? So, you know, I, I said you know last four five years I've been actually looking at the space of autonomous driving driving um, for as long as I can tell. LIDAR has always been the default go-to sensors for, for ADADAS, right? For measuring distance of an object and such. Uh, it actually has been very challenging and I have been myself looking at this space and very skeptical of LIDAR uh, during all this time until I met uh, Mike and Greg. Um, part of the reason from uh, OEM or Tailwind perspective was that cost is cost, right? It's it's you know, used to get, you know, the, the first unit was what, 100,000 or something like that, right? Even today, it was still not quite down to the level, but it's getting there, right? Um, one of the reasons I really like, you know, analog photonics is is because they are putting in the silicon and that's really the key factor. It's like the holy grail to make it cost less, right? The second one is related to is reliability and robustness. And Mike has mentioned about the mechanical pups and those things. It doesn't really last long, for, you know, due to, it depends on the application, but due to vibration, it really is a concern for a lot of OEMs um, for the mechanical, right? Um, so having seen their pitch, having talked to Mike and Greg, I'm excited about this. this I, think, I think we finally, the industry sees something that actually solved and addressed some of the issues that um, I personally think it was is challenging for the industry. Right. So Greg, maybe you want to say something about the scale of cost savings that might be possible or any other sort of consequences of this technological design? Sure. You know, I think the you know, one of the key things to think about, and, and Ray brought it up, was uh, uh, the idea of getting things down to, to silicon, because um, we've seen it in many industries. When you, when you can get everything down on the silicon, when you can get everything down on the wafer, and, and get everything to chip scale, that will be the cheapest. There's, there's really not any, any argument there. So, so that's really the key is, do you have an architecture that allows you to get everything down to silicon? Because you get everything down to silicon, you're going to be less expensive. Now, how much less expensive than, than mechanical solutions? You know, it, as you scale to these volumes, it's a, it's a little bit hard to predict because we don't have these volumes for those kind of mechanical systems, but but quickly, we expect that it will be, you know, three to five x less expensive than mechanical systems. And again, the the, the key um, underlying factor in that is if you get everything down onto silicon, that that means all the photonics, all the electronics, that's going to be your cheapest solution, and uh, and, and and that's what we're able to do. Perfect. <laughs> You know, one of the things that caught my eye about your company in, in our original uh, meeting was, you know, I, I'm not an engineer, so what I like to look for are sort of indirect indications of <clears throat> of, of um, effectiveness or strength or success. Um, and one thing that, uh, Mike, you told me was that you started out your company with some very large DARPA contracts, as well as uh, OEM contracts. Are you able to say a little bit more about those? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I started the company and really bootstrapped the company. Uh, you know, we never took investment. Uh, I, I think the first you know, couple of years were sort of $1 million uh, years in 2014 and 2015. Uh, but then when I uh, took my leave of absence, I brought in two large contracts, a, uh, a DARPA contract for optical phased array LiDAR that was uh, started off at around $20 million and uh, has increased since then. 
uh, and a, um, uh, a contract from Hank Photonics uh, that was on order of $10 million uh, for uh, developing uh, the PDK library that uh, sits in Hank Photonics. And, uh, you know, we're uh, now one of the premier PDK library uh, uh, providers for silicon photonics. And we have interest uh, for, uh, for those components in the commercial foundries as well. Uh, so we're in discussions about uh, providing broader access to that componentry. But that componentry is key for our, for, you know, our datacom space. Uh, so both sides of the company have had significant traction. And that was just the early contracts we have. Uh, joint development agreements with two uh, major tier tier one automotives uh, and uh, you know a number of other contracts. So the, the company financially has just grown. Uh, you know we're somewhere in the range of a fifteen to twenty million dollar per year uh, company today, and we've been profitable every year since inception. Which is a pretty remarkable state of affairs for a semiconductor uh, startup. Uh, I mean, I, I note that, you know, by the way, that it's interesting that, uh, you know, because our event is an auto and mobility tech event, not a semiconductor event, but it's interesting that we have increasingly hardware companies, especially semiconductor companies coming to this event, which is just kind of tells you where this industry is headed, right? Um, uh, but um, anyway, so maybe a few more words about commercial traction. I know, I mean, th those those revenue numbers are pretty amazing, but can can you say a little bit more about where you are in terms of customer traction? Yeah, I can, um, well, I, I think I probably don't want to get into specifics on customers, but I think I, let me, I actually do have a few slides here I can show and talk a little bit about the technology and, and our, our product path. Maybe that would be helpful. Um, this slide shows uh, our FS1 uh, LiDAR. Um, so you can see actually the people walking across the, uh, the street here and they're all showing up on our uh, LiDAR, optical phase array LiDAR. So this was our second um, functional sample that we delivered to uh, a pair of uh, large automotive tier ones, um, uh, both of which I think we're very happy with the delivery. Um, we had promised a 50 meter capable uh, prototype and at 90% probability of detection, we achieved 45 meters at 96% in our testing. Our test range was limited to 45 meters. Um, both automotives have since tested our parts uh, out to 50 meters and achieved the result of 90% probability of detection. Um, and so I think that uh, said something, we were able to deliver uh, what we promised. Um, the other thing I think that is interesting here to look at is this is our optical phase array here. You can see the silicon photonic chip as well as the CMOS driver chips and, uh, and then the board that, uh, that controls uh, all of this. Um, and then the prototype is shown uh, here on the left, as well as on a tripod here on the right-hand side. It's fully self-contained, so the laser sits in there as well. Um, it's about a four to five inch on a side um, box, uh, and uh, most of the volume is just the uh, FPGA boards that are used to process the data, uh, the return data. Um, so that's, uh, that's our last functional sample. We're gonna be delivering another, a second functional sample, uh, a third functional sample shortly in the next uh, month or so. Uh, again, to two tier one uh, automotive uh, customers. Um, this is our uh, our planned product for the long range case. Um, it is intended to be a 200 meter capable uh, part uh, with half a million points per second uh, for a one chip imp implementation and uh, uh, about 1 million points per second uh, for a two chip implementation. And then you can sort of tie all these chips together um, in a way that makes uh, most sense for your specific application, whether it's uh, for one chip 60 by 15 degrees or 60 by 30 degrees for a two chip solution or 120 by 15 degrees, uh, it's really up to the customer in that case. And this gives some you know, estimates of cost. I think as Greg points out, we don't know how low the cost is going to scale to at this point in time. I think we you know, are trying to get realistic costs to the tier ones. And, um, for one chip solution, you're looking at, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of $150 and a two chip solution, you know, somewhere under $300. Uh, so it really depends on specs, but, uh, you know, I think there's some potential there to reduce those costs significantly over time. Um, this is where we see the, uh, you know, the, the technology rollout. Um, so we're going to be delivering functional sample three, uh, sort of mid next year. 
and then functional sample four um, in early 2024, uh, and then finally uh, start stepping through series production. Uh, so A samples, B samples, C samples, uh, with a C sample delivery in uh, 2027 and start of production uh, that year. So that's the general uh, path. Um, as I had indicated, we have two tier ones signed up at the moment. We're uh, expecting that we'll be increasing uh, the numbers signed up to our uh, development teams. Terrific. That's very exciting. Um, you're you're kind, kind of flying in the face of the fact that uh, there's a zillion LIDAR companies out there. <laughs> but uh, it sounds like you have something differentiated in more uh, very, very advanced. I think one of the nice things for us about um, being funded by a lot, of, a lot of our funding being coming from DARPA is that instead of having investors who may have focused us on a Gen 1 solution, uh, DARPA wanted us to solve the hard problems and really go after the phase array problem. Um, and it focused us on what inevitably became a Gen 2 solution. And I think Gen 2 is really where the, the lion's share of the LiDAR market will happen. So. Right. Mike, just quickly, how hard is it for you to go from 50 to 200? Because um, in, in other cases, there was one ladder company in the early years. I don't, I know you what you're talking about, right? Um, so that they actually, at the time, it wasn't go too far. And they had failed to go very far. And that was- We're uh, very confident in our ability to get out to 200 meters at this point. So I don't think it's going to be a huge hurdle for us. In fact, I mean, we're, we are ranging targets today out to 100 meters. Uh, so it's, you know, it's yeah. very much within our grasp. So we're running short on time, but I, I wanted to just cover one last subject. Uh, and, and Raymond, you're welcome to ask one other question too, but uh, where are you in terms of your fundraising um, pathway? Um, you know, we, since we're profitable, we haven't spent a lot of effort on fundraising. I would say almost, right. almost zero. Uh, right. And, um, you know, I, it's not to say that we wouldn't be interested in the, in the right in, uh, investor or strategic partner, uh, but we haven't really had a need yet. So. so you don't really have current plans or immediate and near-term plans for another round or a round? Yeah, there haven't, there haven't been any immediate plans for it. I think we're, you know, always open to having discussions. Um, I, you know, uh, it really, it really be about, you know, accelerating uh, the timeline um, and or expanding the product offering mix. So I think we have some interest in addressing short range too. Um, and we think our LiDAR is very well suited for the short range application because it has a totally flat form factor uh, for short range applications and very, really nice to integrate onto the vehicle. So I think if we expand into more than just long range uh, applications, we may, we may take investment. Right. Uh, Ray, Raymond, I just realized I misspoke your name earlier, Raymond Zung. So sorry for that. No worries. But uh, do you have any uh, questions you want to ask before we wrap it up? No, I, I think um, I'm excited about this. Um, I do have a question about your fundraising. I mean, do you need money to scale your manufacturing? Or the yeah, I, mean, I think as we as we start heading down the path of series production, we're we're going to have to have that conversation with our uh, tier ones and OEMs that we're working with. Uh, and, you know, I think it, it really depends on how, how those deals are uh, structured, but I'm sure as we start scaling things up and we start, you know, running uh, hundreds and thousands of wafers, we're going to need some money to cover. Yeah. Terrific. Okay. Well, this is very interesting. Uh, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Great. Great. Thank you, everybody. Great All to right. See you guys again. Okay. I'm here today with Undertow the CEO, Ashwini Chathari, um, and with my friend, Yvonne Bosch, I mean, Yvonne Lush, with Robert Bosch Venture Capital, um, who will be my co-interviewer for this um, session. So before we get into it, um, Yvonne, could I ask you to, to give a brief uh, self-introduction and, and describe a little bit what you do for Robert Bosch Venture Capital? Sure. Um, thanks, Howard. Um, thanks for inviting me to this interview. So um, I have been with Bosch with the corporation for over 20 years, I have to admit, which is very typical in Germany probably, but un untypical here in Silicon Valley. Um, I joined the venture group, the venture capital team around about five years ago. Um, and um, Robert Bosch Venture Capital does minority investments in startups like any other institutional VC 
we um, do invest um, from funds we are raising, even though one LP, and that's the Bosch Corporation. But otherwise, we rather work like an institutional VC. That means we um, we invest um, with a strategic fit, but independently from the corporation. We don't need any business unit buy-in, blessing, or sponsorship, and we invest for financial return. That's very important to us. Um, areas we are investing in is anything with that kind of fits to the overall umbrella of Bosch, which is very, very broad. I always like to say we invest in autonomous driving, but also in like smart dishwashers, because the product portfolio of the corporation is very broad. Um, and that includes any deep tech and cutting edge technology, including software. Um, right. That's briefly about us. Right. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so we're going to jump right into it with uh, uh, Ashwini and the company. So Ashwini, maybe you can give us a little bit of background on yourself and the background of your company and, and also why is it called Undertow? <laughs> so the last question is uh, easy to answer. Uh, I could not come up with a name that it, I did not have to spell. So I asked my kids to come up with a name and whosever name got selected, they get to choose the place for dinner. So one of the kids came up with that name. And the only requirement was that it, I did not have to spell it and the domain name should be available. So there you have it. It's a good reason. <laughs> so, so that's how the name came about. Uh, the company, we're building a, a depth sensor, a radar, specifically a high resolution radar and high refresh also. Uh, when we look at the autonomy market or ADAS, for, if I can use that, uh, there is no depth sensor that can detect a lane splitting motorcycle. Hmm. That's a big statement to make, but look at it. There is nothing that can actually do that. Uh, all the way from, if you have a motorcycle between two cars and it's 150, 60 meters away, uh, driving at speed, there is no depth sensor that can actually detect it. If you are sitting in your Tesla and in, if you have engaged autopilot, and if you're trying to change lane during rush hours, you will keep sitting in the same lane for a very, very, very long time. It does not have enough space. It does not recognize the edges of the cars in the adjacent lane to really figure out when it is the right time to actually change the lane. So, you know, you'll enjoy your time in the carpool lane if you're sitting in that or any lane for that particular reason. So what we figured out is how to build a depth sensor radar, which actually works in all the weather conditions, unlike LIDAR, which will not work in rain, snow, fog, or whenever there is a moisture in the, in the surroundings, uh, radar works, but uh, it's really good only for shorter distances. So most of the radars, we ship about 350 to 400 million radars a year. Uh, Bosch is one of the biggest uh, suppliers of radars, and uh, so is Continental, Aptiv, and uh, there are a few others. Denso is also one of them. Most of the radars are actually corner radars, which is a code speak for medium range radars. And they are non-imaging radars, only the long range radars, which are mounted in the front center of the car or sometimes in the back center of the car are long range radars. They can see very long distances. However, they don't have the resolution. So what it really means is it can detect a small object. Let's say you have a box which is painted like a squirrel It'll say, oh, there is a box or something, some object there, but it cannot, it doesn't have enough definition to tell you whether it's a squirrel or a cat. Squirrel is a bad example because it's by definition is small. Until unless you get into Texas, then it will be larger, but that's okay. So, so, so we bring definition. So uh, just to contrast it, the current radars are limited in number of points that they generate. Typically radars give you a point cloud. Uh, our radar is an AI-based radar. So we give a point cloud as well as an object list to let the central system decide how they want to use the information. Uh, as a contrast, the typical radar will generate 48 to 50,000 points per second. These are the advanced radars, which are based on FMCW modulation. We generate 72 million points per second. Okay. okay. So the additional resolution gets us to basically add you know, not just detect something, but also uh, really figure out the shape. And uh, the ML engine lets us train the radar 
to really say whether this is a guardrail, these are this, you know, these are the beer trucks. Uh, the difficult case for a radar is to identify a bicyclist, which is sandwiched between a uh, mm -hmm. between a beer truck, right? Uh, 150, 200 meters away, which is similar to identifying a lane splitting motorcycle. Uh, mm -hmm. We can do that, and uh, most of the radars fail at that. So this this session is not going to be a technical session, but could you say something briefly about why it is that you can do this with your radar and why others previously could not? So it comes down to using a modulation scheme. Uh, the current modulation scheme that is used by all the radar companies is called FMCW, Frequency, Mo Frequency Modulation Continuous Wave, which is an analog system. We have actually adopted the digital system that is used in your 5G and also your Wi-Fi called OFDM, Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiplexing. By just going to this, uh, you end up getting a huge amount of uh, uh, utilization of the existing bandwidth. That's one thing. Uh, the innovation is actually around uh, transmitting and receiving at the same time, which is we radar requires a full duplex operation, whereas uh, the 5G or your Wi-Fi does not. So we've done some innovation around that to adapt the pre-existing techniques and build a radar. How's that? Okay, good. So, and one, another question before I get, allow Yvonne to jump in, I'm sure you have a lot of things to ask about too. But so what is it that you would displace with this capability? In other words, currently, what are people trying to use to, to address these needs? And what are you going to, be able to let people not use anymore you know who do you compete with what do you compete with so traditionally to identify objects which are 150 meters away or 250 meters away you, you have no choice but to use a lidar which are expensive and generally unreliable and uh, because we our capability of resolution range is so high we can actually detect small objects all the way to 300 meters so we will end up displacing all the radars and lidars so in the, in, in the ideal cases, assuming you're successful, vehicles in either in the short term or in the longer term would be using optical and your radar and not necessarily LIDAR? No, no LIDAR. There is no need for LIDAR. They, they, they should not exist. Okay. We, should be, we would be able to identify or provide the resolution uh, and be completely you know, uh, agnostic to weather, if I can say that. So, Yvonne, do you believe this is possible? Um, actually, that's, an, that's a very good question, Howard, because when I started to look into the autonomy space, I thought, you know, the more sensors, the better. And I thought we would eventually need, need all the kind of sensors. And I thought that Elon Musk is very, very wrong, telling us years ago that we probably only need cameras. I don't believe we only need cameras, but I also followed the LiDAR space in the last five to seven years. And the, the companies are not there yet where they wanted to go, especially in the, um, in the space of, of the LiDAR cost. It's just too prohibitive. Um, and, and all the big automotive OEMs are working on, on getting um, high advanced ADAS or autonomous vehicles on the roads as soon as possible. Uh, for privately owned passenger vehicles, and for that you need a cost-effective solution. So I actually agree with Ashwini that um, eventually this will be camera and radar only. Ashwini, what do you estimate your ultimate costs will be for a, a unit? So our first thing is, let, before I answer that question, let me just say that uh, we are based on silicon pricing. Mm -hmm. So silicon is always going to be cheaper than you know generating lasers and whatnot. Okay, so just given that, uh, we would fit right into the cost models of a short range, medium range, or long range radar. Currently, mm -hmm. long range radars typically sell for $133. That's the average price. Uh, mm -hmm. The medium range radar, which is also called a corner radar, is about $74, $75. And uh, the short range radars typically sell for $40. Our cost points are below 20. So we would right. be really happy giving higher resolution, getting that socket away from bar. And but it's, it's going to be a very interesting, interesting session in Bonnie Doon, you know, because we have a very advanced LiDAR company coming um, that uh, claim makes very extraordinary claims. 
we also have an optical software company coming that makes very extraordinary strong claims with respect to new capabilities of cameras um, and, and me measurement of distance. So um, I'm, I'm, it's going to be in, you know, kind of cool to get you all in the same room and see if the room explodes. Um, but anyway. <laughs> or you get outside and you do, on, you do a live competition. <laughs> OK, cool. Uh, all right, so um, maybe you can tell us how far have you gotten uh, in real life, Ashwini, uh, in term, either in terms of actual performance of, of your product, um, if you already have, or, uh, and, and or commercial traction. So this is, uh, for us, it's very early days. Uh, we started with uh, building a simulation model end-to-end, -end, uh, yeah. which was built in MATLAB. And uh, we started to take the components of the simulation model and implement it using uh, discrete components. So in the discrete component, uh, we have actually built a single in, single out already, which is operational in the office. And uh, you know because of the chip shortages, right, it's uh, difficult to source many of the components. Uh, but we are actually working to demonstrate a multi-in, multi-out MIMO system where the, the processing would be done offline. Uh, essentially, this will show that OFDM can be used and uh, generally useful in building a radar and giving you higher resolution. Okay. So that's where we are at right now from a technology perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, from a uh, OEM engagement, uh, some of the requirements that I'm talking about, like the detecting a lane splitting motorcycle actually came from one of the OEMs. I'm not at liberty to disclose their names yet. And uh, detecting a mattress flying off a pickup truck at 200 kph also came from another uh, OEM. And they have actually asked us, uh, basically given us a uh, set of tests that we have to pass through to displace a LIDAR. How's that? Okay. So, so we are working through it, and we are also engaged with a few tier ones. So, so we are more at the pilot and NRE stage. And when right. when do you think you'll have actual shipment of, of chips? So the first time the two OEMs are going to do a bake off will be in Q3 of next year, 2023. Okay. That will be based on our actually our internal system is based on two separate chips uh, to custom ASICs. One is a 22 nanometer FTX uh, from Global Foundries, and the digital is uh, going to be a seven nanometer either from TSMC or Samsung. So we would have the, the RF chip done by that time and driven by a FPGA, which will consume a boatload of power, but it will actually show that the resolution can be had. Right. And, and as you well know, um, Ashwini, the, the... The sales cycle for OEMs and, and the automotive industry generally is 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 um, less than ideal. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you do you have both a short term plan and a long term plan, or I mean, how how's this, how's the chronology going to work for you? So look, uh, we are quite aware that uh, selling into passenger car OEMs technology that will sold to OEM that will go into passenger cars is, takes long time because nomination to startup production is very long. Right. Okay. Uh, so what we are doing is uh, we have alternate markets uh, tracking where the autonomy uh, system is actually sold by third party. So you look at companies like Plus AI, uh, M Embark, you look at uh, Garrick, and there are several others, right, who are actually building that, and uh, their qualification cycles are shorter, mm. relatively speaking. So that's one. Uh, and then the radar actually has uh, other applications uh, we can actually detect any arbitrary object in a backpack uh, from 10 meters away without frisking the person you can imagine the things that we can actually do with the radars mm. so there are many other applications but you know the go to market strategy is still to actually go for tracking first and then uh, go into uh, automotive OEMs to sell to passenger cars so ivan i understand that you're an advisor to the company um, so you've probably taken a fairly strong, a deep look at the technology and the company strategy. So maybe you can give your third-party assessment of, of all of what we just heard. Yeah, so, um, I mean, first of all, I think what I said before, the problem with autonomy and with all the sensors is not solved yet. Um, the, the sensors we have currently are still not sufficient and, and or too expensive. So even though my first thought was, another radar startup, um, 
since the problem hasn't been solved yet, there's still room for another radar startup who solves like even longer distance and even higher resolution problems. Um, I met Ashwini and part of the team in person, and I would like Ashwini to tell us a little bit about the team and the people because that's I think that's pretty heavy heavy lifting. Um, that's nothing you want to have, you know, some Stanford graduates to do. Um, that's something you know you not recent graduates. That's that's something you want experienced people in the team because that's from a technology perspective. From, from the radar chip and the digital chip, pretty, pretty um, difficult. So Ashwini, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about the people and the team and why you think that all of you together would pull it off. So look, actually to build a uh, radar that can compete effectively with uh, LIDARs also, because you know that's where the bulk of the money is right now. Uh, you have to look at the different stages of, you know, the entire system consists of an antenna, then it has an analog RF chip, and then it has a digital chip. And we are the first radar, which is actually incorporating a machine learning engine into the digital RF, digital part of the chip. So if you look at the team, um, Eugene Feinberg and myself, we come from the ML background. We did a company called Recognize prior to this, in which uh, uh, Yuvan had actually invested. And uh, we built a the most performant uh, machine learning accelerator in the market today. Okay, there is nobody who can actually even come close to that. So we have the machine learning experience and uh, that was actually built for a imaging system. This one is being built for the RF system. So we bring that experience. Uh, the thing is, you know, to understand the channel of when you are transmitting RF waves and when they return, you need to have experience in building OFDM system. We have a person in our team who has been doing this for 25 years, over 25 years. He's been around all the 3G, 4G, 5G, and also the Wi-Fi system. Tolis is the guy. And uh, then outside of that, we actually have a very experienced analog designers in the team. Uh, there is a guy called Hassan Mohajri, who was the first guy who built a echo cancellation that is really needed because you know at these frequencies, when you're transmitting, it starts to interfere with your uh, receivers. So we have the team and the Fourth person, one more person in our team is Karthik, who's based in Belgium. His PhD thesis is the basis for the under data. So I think, you know, from uh, from an implementation perspective, we think we have the essential pieces to really execute this and make this project a reality. Sounds like a pretty high powered team. So um, we're running short on time, but I, I, there's one last area that we need to cover. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, uh, where do you stand with respect to your capital formation? So what have you raised so far? Uh, who are your, can you say who your lead investors are and what are your plans for the future? Look, uh, we have a, uh, we raised $3 million in safe note mm -hmm. uh, from trucks. Riley is going to be at the conference. So he's one of the guys who right. gave us the money. And uh, there is, uh, that's 2 million from them and 1 million from uh, Sanjay Chha. And uh, we have a term sheet uh, for a 15 million raise uh, that will actually take us to the point where we can demonstrate the, the RF chip with a driven by an FPGA uh, sometime end of next year. And uh, we're looking for uh, yeah. other investors to join the that round. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, it's very clear. I'm sure you're going to be.